I have a question for you. What do you want more of in this coming year? Could you, could you help me out with an answer? What do you want more? Tell me something. More what? More prayer. More of Jesus. More discipline. Uh-huh. What do you want more of? More. <laughs> Tell the truth, more money. The text is Luke chapter 2 from verse 25. You'll see it up on the screen just now. This, I am more concerned about the second coming of Jesus than the first coming. But if there wasn't a first coming, there will never be a second coming. Watch this. This is a big picture. There were eight characters involved just at the coming of Jesus Christ's birth. It was Zacharias and Elizabeth, John the Baptist, Mary and Joseph, the angels, Hannah in the temple, and Simeon. I have preached on these eight characters already in a series one year. What I'm saying is the same, this is the big picture now, the same kind of people with the same kind of character and the same kind of expectation at the first coming of Jesus will be the same kind of people with the same kind of character at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You'll see the word same here. So that's the big picture. I'll tell you what I need more of and what this church needs more of. Our little granddaughter was sick with a rash. We were putting medications and doctor prescription and it wasn't, it wasn't working. So she called the doctor and the doctor said, listen, what you need to do is put a double application. Do more. Put more. It needs more. Which brings me to my topic. But let me read the text so you'll get the topic. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same, so I'm talking about the same people there, it's the same people we will need here. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Four points there. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Number one, the Holy Ghost was upon him. Number two, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. That he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Some good thoughts there. Verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Three points about the Holy Spirit in this man's life. And we'll see the results. Verse 28. Then he took him up, Jesus, in his arms. And blessed God and said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. You know that song? The coming of the king. Verse 34, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary, such and such. I think I need, and our church need, a bigger dose of the Holy Ghost. I think we need more of the Spirit of God. 
My theme is the empowered life. You see how this man was empowered by the Spirit of God. I am not trying to be funny or spiritual, but I am definitely telling you that what we need more of is the Holy Spirit. More love, yes. More joy, yes. More blessings, yes. More uh, fellowship, yes. More programs, yes. But above and beyond all of that, we need more of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, nothing is going to happen. The convener of the, I think uh, one of the Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention said, if the Holy Spirit were taken out of the church, 95% of church work will still go on. That's a sobering thought. The church can go on and has been going on without the power, presence, and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And I say we need more of the Holy Ghost. Let's go to the text. Behold, look. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man. And that's why I said the same people there is the same people we would need now. One, he was in his sameness. He didn't change. He was a stable character. He was not unstable. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It is good that when we remain committed, steadfast, occupied, and remain the same in what we do and who we are. At the same time, it is not good that we remain the same. Because we got to change from glory to glory to glory. Every year should see us better. If I am the same person I was last year, there is no change in my life. I need to change. I need to constantly climb higher to the image of Jesus Christ. I am not in competition with any other person or character or ministry. I have to give account to the Lord for my own life. And so will you. The same man, he was just, he was fear, he was balanced, he was not too critical or non-critical, he was just. And we need balance in our conclusions. There's a big war on Facebook now with a certain preacher, a good man if you ask me, I love that brother, I love his preaching, but... People are being unjust. They don't know the man. They've never sat with him and they've drawn conclusions. I will not be part of that discussion. Uh, if we're going to be just, we have to give justice. And we have to be right. What does the Lord require of you, O man of God, that you do justly? Humble yourself and walk with your God. He was a just man. He was devout. Devoted, committed, not sporadic in his duties, devout, devoted. I am wondering what is the one thing in your life that you're most devoted to? I know family comes first and that is true. Devotion and devoted and duty to your family cannot be substituted for anything else. And while in our human plane and on a human level we have devotions for this and that, above and beyond that, I think that our devotion to be, should be to our Lord Jesus Christ full and foremost. Are you with me? I'm missing my Jamaican folks. I'd have gotten about 10 amens already and about five hallelujahs. And somebody would have been jumping up and, and, and shaking. Hallelujah. Come on, guys. Let, let's preach together. He was the same man, unstable. He was just, fair and balanced. He was devout and devoted. And he was waiting. This is probably some of our biggest problems. We don't know how to wait. 
And, and, and he, he just was waiting. And the day would come when your waiting will, and your expectation will be met. And it can only be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He was waiting for consolation. I am asking you that question this morning. Do you need consolation? Do you need consoling? What is troubling you? What is breaking your heart? What is destroying your peace and taking away your joy? What is it that you need consoling? And the Holy Spirit is the best consoler and comforter there is. And that's why we need more of the Holy Spirit. He will console you, Jesus said. He will comfort you when I'm gone. Can you say, I need more? I need more of you, Lord. Say it with me. I need more of the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise his holy name. So now the, the scripture said, uh, in his character, I'm going to say something to you. That character, as good as it is, is not enough. You could be a very good person. You could be devout, devoted. You could be waiting patiently. You could be a charmer. You could be a beautiful greeter. You could be a wonderful person, a nice giver. Character is great. And it's the revelation of the fruit of the spirit in an individual's life. But we need more than good character. We need the spirit of God upon our lives. And I'm, 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 I'm praising good character. I want more uh, 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 good characters around me. But although he had all these qualities, he had something extra. Like the wise virgins, you don't just have enough. For the moment, you've got to have a little extra. And so, good character and a nice life is wonderful, but we need the first of the three things. The Spirit of God was upon him. Was, was upon him. Watch this. What does it mean to be the Spirit of God upon you? We know in the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God came upon them. We know in the, uh, that's in the upper room. We know in the private room that Jesus blew into them the breath and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost was in them. Before he, that, he said, The Holy Spirit is with you and he shall be in you. So we have the three positions of the Holy Spirit. With you, in you, and on Pentecost, upon you. So let us talk about the upon. The upon is the empowerment. This is why I call it the empowered life. Watch what the empowerment will do. In Genesis 1, and the earth was void, empty, and darkness was upon the face of darkness. And the Spirit of God brooded upon the waters. The Holy Spirit came and sat upon the earth like a mother chick, chicken with, a, with an egg and, and decided to give its warmth and to develop and to bring a chaotic earth into a renewed situation. And this is what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes upon you. One, he will take away your emptiness and give you fullness. He will take away your darkness and give you light. He will take away your chaos and give you joy. He will take away the deformity and reform your life. All that the Holy Spirit would come upon us and do his transforming work. Can I hear somebody understanding me and say amen? So, to be empowered... And to live the godly, good character, spiritual life, the Holy Spirit is so necessary. Secondly, and it was revealed unto him by the Spirit. It's not just upon you for ministry, but the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you that nobody knows. And nobody can show you, but the Holy Spirit. If you have a relationship with God, I guarantee you that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. 
I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will speak to you in dreams or the word or somehow, but God will speak. God did speak there and he's still speaking today. And so we need to expect the personal revelation of the Lord. The Lord revealed some things to him and I'll show you just now uh, how practical the revelation was. I know we have fantasies and we confuse uh, our own desires and mindsets and our thinking patterns with the Holy Spirit and sometimes we get them mixed up. But this one is practical. When you have a revelation, you keep it to yourself like Mary pondered it in her heart and she did not share what was meant for her. And sometimes the revelation you get is not for everybody. It is for you. And you take that and you benefit from it. And if God says, well, look, this is for the church, then you give it to the church. But he will reveal. I remember a story, real in my life, uh, quite a few years ago. We were shopping for a house. We saw this nice, cute, beautiful house. Really nice. We wanted 1.2 million for it. I scratch everywhere I can scratch. I said, buddy, that is too much. We, we, cannot, we cannot afford that. But he looked at me in a funny way. And the spirit of the Lord said to me, I'll never forget that moment. It was an aha moment. He said, watch that man. He's going to come to you with a trick. I actually heard those words. So I said, I can't afford it. Uh, thank you, it's a beautiful home. And I, I left. The next day he called me. He said, listen, I have a plan. I can show you how you can get this house. I can show you how you can pay off for it quickly. I said, okay, I'm listening. But the Lord had already warned me, have no dealings with this man. But I listened. He said, listen, I am going to give you $100,000 cash. I want you to put it in church. And I want the church to write a check back for me for $10,000. You're going to make a profit of $90,000. I already know what that is. That's money laundering. Giving me $100,000 cash to put it in church and just write a check for some kind of anything, you work you did, make up a story, and give him back a check for $10,000. I didn't need much revelation, but I'm glad the Lord had already spoken to me. Do not touch that kind of nonsense. I gave you a practical illustration, not a spiritual one. I have many spiritual revelations. But I am telling you in a practical way, God can tell you what to do and what not to do. God can tell you who to hang out with and who not to hang out with. God can tell you what to accept and not to accept. It was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. And what was revealed? He shall not see death until he sees the glory of Jehovah. And let me put that in, in the second coming aspect. If the rapture would have come this week or soon, some of you will never see death. I say never see death. Because you will have seen the glory of the Lord. And that's our consolation. And that's our expectation. And that's our hope. Come Lord Jesus. And I will wave death. Bye bye. Goodbye death. You will never touch me. And I will shout in the air. Oh death. Where is your sting? Oh grave. Where is your victory? Hallelujah. <laughs> waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ. Waiting for the consolation of his second coming. May the Lord reveal to you. I am fully convinced that the coming of the Lord is near. Amen. And I shall, not live, I shall not die, but I shall live. I want to hear the trumpet, not in the grave. I want to hear it uh, sitting down or standing up, better yet in church. Amen. Look for the sound of the trumpet. Can I hear somebody say, da, 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 da. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And thirdly, 
Bible says, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. I am asking you the question, what leads you to church? What brings you to church? Why do you come to church? Well, if I don't come, the pastor, somebody's going to call me and ask me why, why I wasn't here. So let me go to please them. Well, I go because I have to give my offering and I, I want to do it personally. I don't believe in mailing it. I, I just want to come and drop it. Why do you come to church? What motivates you to come to church? What brings you here? Oh, I love the people. I want to fellowship. I want to greet the saints. All what I just said is wonderful and beautiful. But I am saying, when you are led by the Spirit to church, when the Spirit himself drives you to church, nobody will ever have to come and encourage you to come to church. Because you are driven by the highest power. You're driven by the grace of the God who loves us. And I pray... That when you come to church, it is spirit-led and spirit-driven. The spirit was upon him. The spirit revealed things to him. And the spirit led him. For as many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. Now you're a child of God. Expect him to lead you. And he may lead you in some rough parts. He may even lead you in the valley of the shadow of death, but you will fear no evil because he is with you. Amen. He may lead you in the rough side of the mountain where the devil's waiting to tempt you, but he will stand with you and you will stand with him. Amen. I don't know where he may lead you, but wherever he leads you, he can feed you. Yes. And he can keep you. Yes. Like I say to my wife, or about my wife, where she leads me, I will follow. And where she feeds me, I will swallow. <laughs> Men, you got to be led sometime. And if your wife don't lead you, the Holy Spirit will. And thank God for good women. Thank God for praying women who, who can put a word into the life of their, their husband who knows it all. Ladies, we salute you. You're the best thing God ever given. To us, his wives. I'm almost finished. We are not looking to create programs to attract people. The programs are good. We must have them. We're planning some great things for next year. Training program, seminars, children church, raising up choir, doing a lot of stuff. And we need to do those things. We are a living body. We are organized people. We have to get these things going. But that's not our priority. Our priority is the invading presence of the Holy Spirit. Once he's leading us. Once he's the attraction. Once Jesus is lifted up and God gets the glory. People will come. People will follow. They're looking for a real church with real people. Can you say amen? A point to note is that in verse 27, the parents brought the child to the temple. The child couldn't walk yet. When he was 12 years old, you see, when you train up a child in the way he should go, bring your children to church. I don't care how much noise they make. We'll put them in the back, but bring them to church. So that by the time he was 12 years old, he had been churched every Saturday. He knew the scriptures. He was uh, uh, extremely educated in the word of God so that he was confusing the doctors of law and the scribes and the Pharisees in the temple at 12 years old. If you don't bring your child up in the Lord, the court will. Take it seriously, the children. What you put into them now will show up later. And you, the Russians said, give me, give me a child for the first three years. 
just give me your child for the first three years and I'll give him back to you. Why? Because they know that the first three years are the formative years of a person's character. And when they indoctrinate you there, that will stay with you for all your life. And so if after three years, you can't train a child anymore, you can only discipline them. You can only them, stop doing that. Don't do this. I told you so. And this and that. But they already formed. The Bible calls us the bent. When a child has a bent, when he's already bent, you can't straighten him out. So train him up while you have the time. May God bless you as you continue to, to repair what is broken in the child's life. Then when he saw the child, he took him up in his arms. What a privilege. But we also have the same privilege. We don't have a baby, but we have a Christ, the Lord, that we can embrace. I can hug Jesus every time I want to. He's real. And he will not refuse my embrace. He wants it. Because we are accepted in the beloved. God have accepted us in his son. And uh, a fellowship between him and I, you and him, is, is, is so precious. I, I, I thought about it. And I marveled, although I knew the scripture so well, that verse, that it pleased the father. It pleased the father that in him should all the fullness of the Godhead dwell bodily. God has been pleased to deposit in his son everything that heaven has. And I have the opportunity to embrace that. What a privilege. Oh, hallelujah. And then he blessed God. Watch two things. He blessed God for the opportunity. And how do you bless God? Can you give him money and things, material? No. God doesn't need it. That's not how we bless God. The literal meaning of the bless God means to speak well of him. I will bless the Lord with my mouth. I will speak well about God. Like Job and his wife. You have a choice. When bad things happen to good people, you can either praise the Lord or you can decide you want to curse God and die. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Make your mouth the gateway of praise. He blessed the Lord. And finally, verse 34, and Simon blessed them. When you know how to bless God, you will know how to bless people. You understood what I just said? When you know how to bless God and God don't need what money you can give, you will know how to bless people. If a brother comes to you and says he's hungry or he's tired and naked, and you say, oh my. God, go with you, brother. God bless you and keep you warm. God will provide for you. And, and then John said, if you have it in your pocket. How can you have the love of God dwelling in you when you know that this person needs a blessing? You have it and you didn't give it and you send them away empty. That is vain religion. So learn how to bless people. This Christmas, quite a few people have blessed us. And we are thankful. May you continue to bless one another. Materially, lovingly, spiritually, prayerfully. Because if your life is empowered, if the Holy Spirit is upon you, if the Holy Spirit is within you, if the Holy Spirit is leading you, if the Holy Spirit is hovering over you, if your life is empowered, you will do all things that are impossible with men. And finally, 
for the second time. Um, verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Do people marvel at you, what you say? Do people marvel at your life? Do they look at you? Do they put a question mark, an exclamation, or do they put a wow? We've got to think about it. Our lives impact people. They have no other gospel but to see us. And while I am definitely not perfect and full of flaws, Jesus is not. That's why I have to hide and let Jesus be seen so that he will get the glory. We need more of the Holy Spirit. Would you say that? More. I need more. I need a bigger dose of the Holy Ghost. This concluding illustrations I've given before, but I love it. Wife sent his, her silly husband to the market to buy a pork leg. And uh, she wrote down some instructions. So when he went, he got the pork leg and he asked the butcher for a recipe. He would like to have this cooked in a special way. So the butcher gave him the recipe and he was merrily going home and he wanted to drink some water and he put down the pork leg. Up comes a dog, snatch the leg and run away. And the man started to laugh. <laughs> you got the leg, but I got the recipe. You'll never enjoy it. <laughs> and that's the problem with the church. We have the recipe. We know what to do. We know how to plan. We know how to organize. But where is the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost? Where is the real deal? Yeah. Come, Lord Jesus. Think. Send your power. Amen. Send more of the Holy Ghost. I say more in 2024. More of the Holy Ghost in our lives and in our church. Pastor. Hallelujah to Jesus. Could you give, could you give Jesus some praise? Hallelujah. Could you thank God for the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.